What's up, everyone? Welcome to First 30 Days. I'm your host, Brant Daniels. Um, I'm here tonight. I got a special guest, Coach William Payne. He's the head men's basketball coach at SUNY Adirondack up in New York. Uh, before we get started, I just want to thank Brandon and Adam and, and everybody else at Rising Coaches for giving me the opportunity to host this show. We really wanted to take a look into what the first 30 days at a bunch of different positions on a college basketball staff look at so, or look like. So over the course of the series, we're going to have men's and women's head coaches on, assistants at, um, on both sides, admin spots and, and GAs, and hopefully maybe even down to managers. So I think it's going to be a great uh, series and really, really excited about it. Um, if you haven't got a chance to check out Rising Coaches and everything they offer, make sure you head to risingcoaches.com. Uh, by far uh, the best investment I've made in my professional career. So like I said, tonight's guest, Coach William Payne, Coach P is the new head men's basketball coach at SUNY Adirondack. Um, you probably also know him from Twitter, uh, where he runs the college basketball process, where he's literally um, put hundreds of kids in touch with college coaches across the country at every level, um, including sending a couple my way, which I appreciate him for. So Coach Payne, man, thanks for joining us. How's everything going? Man, if I were any better, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you, man. So uh, how's uh, what's quarantine look like for you with everything going on? I know it's a little bit different for everybody. Uh, you know, for me, it hasn't been very different. Um, you know, one of the blessings I have as uh, outside of basketball, I'm a licensed therapist. Uh, <laughs> I kind of made a little mistake and uh, missed up on – getting some hours in that I needed. So when basketball shut down, I took advantage to, to fill in some hours that I needed to maintain my license. And uh, so I've been working a lot, really. Um, so not a lot different uh, outside of having the kids at home a lot. Not a lot different. No, no events to go to, uh, things like that this summer. But aside from that, not a lot different day-to-day -day life. Awesome, man. Well, let's kind of dive right in. Let's start with let's you as a person. Can you tell us uh, – a little bit about you, your background, how you got your start in basketball all the way to how you wound up at Adirondack. Sure, man. I mean, basketball for me, I, I don't – I can't think back to the earliest memories without basketball in my hands. Um, you know, I was born in Memphis. Memphis is – you know, for people that aren't from that area, they don't understand how big basketball is in Memphis. I mean, basketball in Memphis, I mean, that's truly one of the seven or eight true hoops hotbeds in the United States, and a lot of people don't know that. Um, I also have a lot of relatives from southeastern Kentucky, so they're obviously insane basketball fans in that area. So, uh, you know, I, I would visit family in, in, in the, you know, the country at home, and so my earliest memories have basketball. So grew up playing basketball uh, all the way through, you know, middle school, high school, went on to play college, was not the best player, but had opportunity to play in college. Uh, I was actually much better at football than I was basketball, and, and when I – went to college I actually went to college initially D1 school on a football scholarship uh, never played a down uh, redshirted my first year and that's when I really fell in love and understood that I was going to basketball was going to be what I wanted to do uh, <clears throat> you know switch schools played basketball to really really small schools and it was called Free Will Baptist at that time it's now Welch College right outside of Nashville uh, <clears throat> and so played you know did, did, did the college basketball thing and graduated and I didn't know coaching was going to be in my future uh, and unlike most people all of my paid coaching has been at the college level actually um, and so I didn't have any high school days or anything like that the actual coaching start though came working with a pretty high level AAU program in Nashville uh, that's where the initial coaching you know entry into the coaching world if you will started and and through that, that led to my my first initial coaching job was at uh, actually an uncred, unaccredited institution, uh, and, and it was so unaccredited. When I tell this story, it blows some people's minds. We actually were trying to schedule a basketball game on an outside court one day, uh, and a college basketball game, right? Because we had some issues with our facility, and uh, and so I. <laughs> It was crazy, but we were actually working to get, we couldn't get a facility and we were looking to rent a park. <laughs> That's a true story. And so uh, unaccredited route and all that stuff. Um, had a couple stops at NCCAA schools, uh, moved up to Cincinnati uh, back in 2015, took a job at UC Claremont and um, was at UC Claremont. Um, 
some things kind of happened after my first year at UC Claremont from a personal perspective that prevented me from uh, coaching again. And I thought that coaching was finished for me. And that, that's kind of what gave rise to the college basketball process. I thought my coaching days were finished. Uh, we were kind of married to the Cincinnati area for a couple of reasons. My wife's job and my son's autism. Many of you guys that, that know me through social media or whatnot, I have an autistic son uh, that was accepted into a research, research study program at University of, not University, I'm sorry, I say that wrong every time, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Uh, and that's one of the top three kids hospitals in the United States. So I uh, kind of thought coaching was was finished for a while because we were married to the area. And as you guys know, landing a college gig is tough to begin with. But when you say that you're, you know, landlocked into an 80 mile radius, it really gets tough. Right. So, uh, you know, I've been a college coach for almost a decade at that point. But I thought it was behind me, or at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, and that kind of gave birth to the college basketball process. And that thing just has taken on a life of its own. I don't even, you know, I remember when I started that thing, I, I wrote down on a, <laughs> on a napkin that I wanted to get 500 followers. And I wanted to help three kids get into college. And that was kind of the goal. And, and that thing, I don't even know anymore what it's doing. It's kind of, you know, we've got multiple interns and, and all this stuff. And um, so I thought that was going to be, my basketball life for the foreseeable future, then Miami Hamilton job came open and that fell right into my lap. So um, was there last year and uh, some things kind of happened and uh, had an opportunity. I actually had an NAI head coaching opportunity that I seriously considered and turned down. Uh, and then the Adirondack job came open and, and due to a series of events, I, I decided to to take that position. So uh, been coaching now. This will be my 15th season going into this year. Well, if we have a season, will be my 15th year at the college level. Um, and I've been at six schools total. Yeah. So you're at home. You get the call from the AD at Adirondack. Um, one, how do you handle that call as a head coach? And the excitement and everything that goes with it. And then two, how did you handle that next conversation with Miami Hamilton? So that, that's, you know, I'm actually going to, I hope, I really, really hope that a lot of people watch this via the replays and the, and the YouTube, because what happened, it was, it was not good actually. Uh, and, and I want to be kind of a poster child for what not to do. Um, because what ended up happening was I got the call and, and, and as, this is going to sound very egotistical, but I kind of knew I was getting the job. Uh, from, from, I just felt it. From the moment I interviewed, the very first time, I just felt that the job was mine. Um, and, and so when I got the call, I was, I was pretty ecstatic. Um, and I, uh, <laughs> so I told him, hey, let's do it. Let's run with it. But he wanted to actually wait a few days to make it official until some things went through with, from a paperwork perspective. So I actually didn't want to resign at that point because wasn't sure if whatever, because he didn't even tell me what he was referring to. He said, there's a couple things, a couple uh, T's we need to cross and I's we need to dot to make it official. And I'll reach out to you in a couple of days, but the job is yours. Yeah. Uh, so interestingly enough, during that time, I had second thoughts. <laughs> uh, uh, some of you guys that aren't familiar with uh, Miami Hamilton or, or, or even the level they're in or any of that stuff, uh, you guys may not know, uh, but we had a lot coming back. Uh, we were going to be an extremely good basketball team. Uh, in fact, we were going to bar none be the most talented basketball team I had ever coached. Um, and I've, I've been asked, you know, how good would you have been this year? And, and, and on paper, we were going to be Mid-South and AI good this year. Uh, I mean, that, that's the type of talent we had coming in, the, the type of players we had returning. Um, and we just had some really good, good young people that not only were good on the court, but bought into the culture and all those other things that are wildly important. And so I, I, I would say we were top tier, not, not necessarily Georgetown good, but we were that very next level of NAI talent. That's the kind of stuff we had coming in. And so uh, I actually had second thoughts and, and almost called Adirondack and told them I'd changed my mind. And um, um, after I talked to my family, I decided that wasn't what I was going to do. Uh, I decided to, to definitely 100% take the position. Um, and so there was a lot of excitement, a lot of nerves, uh, a lot of emotions going through that process. Uh, but ultimately, it was the right decision to make. Awesome. So, you know, in your mind, at least, 
if there's three things every coach should do right when they find out they get a job and, and you could kind of list them in order, what would be the first three things you could do in a perfect scenario? In a perfect scenario, the very first thing you should do after you accept the position is start reaching out to the school and the players that you're currently at if you are a current coach, right? If, if that is your scenario, but not everybody's a coach in the moment, so that's going to look different for everyone. But if you are a current coach, the very first thing you need to do is reach out to those players, your returning players, your recruits, that school, give them an idea of what's going on. Uh, and I don't even think there's a close second. Everything else will vary. That's number one by a long shot. Uh, what two or three may look like is going to be very dependent on where you are uh, as a coach. Uh, are you just getting back into coaching? You know, number two could be very different for that guy. Uh, so for me, I can't emphasize enough. It's number one and then everything else. And that's truly reaching out to those players. Uh, the second thing would, would definitely be them making contact with the current players that are at the school with the position you're taking. That's wildly important because uh, I think it's taken for granted by a lot of coaches, but you got to start recruiting those young people. Right. People think because they're there, they're coming back. That's not true. You then have to recruit those young people. Right. And I found out the hard way last year that I actually scared a couple guys off. Uh, I lost a couple players at at Hamilton because they saw me on Twitter and they're like, oh, this guy's just going to replace us anyway. And they left before I even had an opportunity to talk to them. And so those are the the biggest two things um, is is reach out to the, you know, the players that, that you were coaching next, in my opinion, would be reach out to the players that are there. And then uh, if I had to pick a third, it would be going ahead and start making your presence known at the school you're going to. Yeah. I can't stress that enough. It's wildly important in most situations, especially at the small college level, the men's basketball coach rightly or wrongly is often the face of the athletic program. And, and and maybe that's not fair. Maybe the football team or the baseball team is better or what, whatever. But rightly or wrongly, that's often the case. And so you have to immediately let people know who you are and start that process of building those relationships and that communication with those people. For sure. Both those first things you mentioned are, uh, you know, two very different conversations. Saying goodbye wow. oftentimes is really sad. Lots of emotions evolved, especially with young people. And then sometimes it can be difficult talking to the new roster too. So how did you handle that dynamic with both those conversations? First, your players at Miami Hamilton and then. Well, and that's, that's, you know, this is going to go off topic and this is going to, well, it's going to be on topic, but it's not going to go the way you're expecting. So the, my news broke before I was able to talk to my players. And, um, it, you know, this this Twitter exposure that I, I now have has a lot of downsides. Yeah. And um, so what happened ultimately was um, the story broke nationally about 10 o'clock in the morning, the day that I took the job. And it wasn't relayed correctly that they should not have broken the story. Yeah. And And so I actually was doing some therapy that day. Uh, It was actually my last full-time day of getting my hours called up. And so I went into the office and put my phone down. (laughs) And then when I was able to look at my phone again, I had over a hundred text messages and, and I forgot how many DMs and a lot of disappointed people that found out versus me being the one to tell them. Yeah. The only saving grace uh, is that I did text. I had a group thread that was already going with some current players at Hamilton, and I had sent them a message saying I need to talk to you. No, never did I think that when I picked my phone up again, they would know what was going on, um, but um, they did. And so I then had to have some very difficult conversations yeah. with, uh, with some parents, with players, and explain to them, why I made the decision that I made. And um, that wasn't easy because uh, coming from somebody who, who preaches, um, you know, finding your fit and doing those things, it was a difficult, difficult conversation to have. Uh, and I, I had to prioritize. I, I started with the young people that were returning and then I worked my way down the list and it even got to the point to where some players didn't even want to talk to me by the time I tried to reach out. They felt they were hurt. They were disappointed. And I completely understand that. And um, it still bothers me now that that happened. 
and and that opened up an entire other window of hey why are you doing this yeah. and, and so I, I just had to continue to work uh, I still haven't made it right with all of them because there's a couple that still don't want to talk right they they wanted to play for me and so it's something that I'm going to work for pretty much every day via reaching out through Twitter or showing support or whatever I can do to to show them that that was not what was meant to happen and that was that was difficult yeah, it's tough, especially nowadays, because the media get their hands on something and they don't know that whole dynamic. Or some of them, you know, unfortunately, reality is they just don't care. So they run with the story to be first. Yep. Yeah. And then you leave a whole roster full of kids heartbroken and everything. So yep. you take over the new roster, um, you know, looking at last year, some improvement to be made. So how did you handle those conversations with the current roster and, and going forward? Sure. Uh, so that, I didn't get to do that as quickly as I wanted to. So uh, that actually didn't happen for almost two weeks. Uh, there were some issues with um, getting me some information and things that took place. Um, and, and what I initially did was I reached out to everyone individually and, and introduced myself and, and let them know that I wanted to have a conversation and, and hopefully recruit them to come back to Adirondack. Um, we're in a unique position. Uh, let me rephrase that. We're in a very unfortunate position, though, that we only have a handful of players that are able to come back. So I still reached out to all of them, though, even the ones who weren't able to come back and said, hey, you're a part of this family. If there's anything I can do for you, this is who I am. And I, you now have my full support. And uh, I basically just started that process of recruiting those young people all over again, introducing myself my background, what I bring to the table, how I can help them, why I think that I would be able to, you know, help them further in their career, possibly going on to four-year institutions, uh, and all the things that I bring to the table to help them as student athletes. And so uh, it just it just started in that process again, introducing myself. Um, <laughs> I, I've decided now that I'm never going to call. I'm always going to text first, right? <laughs> so people are like, why are you calling me? So especially you get a random call. <laughs> so um, I, I text everybody first and introduce myself and say, hey, I would love to have this conversation with you. And I just started that process. And there's still two right now to this day that I'm still recruiting that I haven't committed to coming back yet, right? They're just fully bought in yet. Um, and, and because of furloughs and things, I can only talk on certain days and I can only represent the university at certain times. And, and so that's making it really unique as well and challenging and difficult. So, um, but they've all really respected the way that I came uh, with my message and how I reached out and, and the things we've done. So it's just really it's simple. It's starting that recruiting process all over again. Yeah. So there's like, you know, no blueprint, obviously, to take a head coaching job in the middle of a pandemic, right? So you're not. What I'm going to write one on it for the next one, though. You need to write a book. You need to team up with a bunch of other people. But um, so, so what does the moving situation look like, and how are you going to tackle that in terms of finally making your transition to New York and uh, with your family and housing and all that type of stuff? Uh, well, so I'm probably going to be solo for the first year yeah. uh, just because there's so many unknowns at this point. Um, you know, I've heard some some really interesting rumors around, you know, there's some people that are saying like super small colleges may not even play the whole year. And there's like, there's some people even throwing out the ideas of not playing until there's a vaccine and all kinds of stuff out there. Right. So there's just too many unknowns at this point yeah. for us to go now. Uh, I'm just going to wait it out. And for me, so because it is so unique, I'm just going to wait it out and, and, and go up when I can. There's, there's some, living opportunities that aren't going to be difficult for me to take advantage of. So I'm just going to kind of wait it out at this point uh, when they, you know, we can't even be on campus with the, with the players at this point. Um, and so until we get clearance for that stuff, I'm just going to pretty much take it day by day. Like most of everybody is um, there's just too many unknowns. And so I'll head up uh, as soon as I get the opportunity to. So the day that I get that phone call and it says, Hey, you can get your guys on campus. You can start working out. I'll be there that night. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> no, I think it's like a little bit unknown because it's not normal in the rest of the professional world, I guess, to have a to-do list for yourself when you take over a job. I think most head coaches come in with a sure. to-do list, especially for these first 30 days. So were you able to tackle your whole to-do list despite not being on campus or did you have to alter that and add to it? Uh, I was able to do most of it. Um, the, 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 couple things I was obviously the things I was not able to do was be in person evaluating certain players. Uh, obviously I couldn't do that. 
uh, by and large, I was able to do most of the things on my, my to-do list. Um, I had a pretty, pretty detailed to-do list. In fact, they kind of, when I did the peer uh, athletic interview at, at SUNY ADK, they kind of laughed at me for all the stuff that I sent them. He was like, we wanted you to leave a little bit of room for interpretation and you left none. I sent a really detailed packet and portfolio and, and how I wanted to attack things. And so, um, yeah, by and large, I would say I got about 95% of it done. Um, and it was pretty detailed and I was still able to do about 95% of it and rightly or wrongly unfair or, or fair Twitter has been very helpful for me. <laughs> so that, that's, that, that, that's a way that I was able to do some of those things that I don't think I might've been able to do any other way. Yeah. I know like it kind of in line with that, like every school has their own little niche and way of doing things. So was there anything that you had streamlined that was super easy for you to handle at Miami Hamilton that you've had to adjust to a little bit um, and stuff you're doing now? Yeah, but it's not necessarily at the school. Um, one big difference is Miami Hamilton is a four year and, you know, SUNY ADK is a JUCO, right? However, I was allowing certain players at Hamilton to, to de facto treat it like a junior college, right? Give them an opportunity to play against higher, higher competition, use that as an opportunity to be seen and possibly move on for opportunities to play at other institutions. Uh, but the, the biggest difference isn't necessarily with the schools as it is, I had to, had to, that's, that's ridiculous to say, because I'll be learning for a long time. The difference is in the regions, yeah. right? So because I'd already been in um, Cincinnati, Cincinnati is a large metro area. Queensbury is very small and rural. So it, learning the high school coaches in that area takes a day, right? Yeah. I already knew most, you know, 99% of the high school coaches in Cincinnati um, to where as in, in, in New York, I, I much more have to recruit state. I can't rely on a player or players within an hour radius. In Cincinnati, I actually could. Yeah, I had players outside of that radius, but worst case scenario, I wouldn't have to drive more than 20 minutes to see any player that I was interested in. Um, so the biggest, the biggest challenge for me was making the move mentally and connection wise. Uh, one of the, one of the big things I had on my list, and this was actually so, what I gave them as an outline for first seven days, next 14 days, first 30 days, one of the big things that he said I would not be able to do that I was successful at was I wanted to actually make documented contact with 150 high school coaches in New York, first seven days. And he was like, that's pretty lofty. And I actually touched base with over 200. Um, and so, but again, a lot of that was via social media that I would not have been able to do any other way. Uh, and of those 200, I did not know 190 of them yeah. or didn't even know of them. Right. And so that was vital. I wanted to I wanted to get that out there quick, fast and in a hurry. Uh, and that was very crucial. Like he asked me, hey, what's the first thing you can do when you take this job? I said, well, the very first thing I'm going to do is let Hoop Dirt, Juco Advocate and a few other social media outlets know because I want to you know, we've been down on our luck for a couple of years here. I want to start generating recruiting buzz immediately right and so um and that was something that was huge i wanted to get that out there i wanted people to know uh because there's enough enough people that follow me that i knew i would start getting an influx of potential players and so that was huge for me and, and then i broke down how i wanted to touch base and make documented contact with that many coaches um and so that was the big thing is is just seeing how different the landscape is uh, high school basketball is so very – like, I still say to this day, and I make people mad, and, and, and you haven't been in Indiana, I'll probably upset you about this too. I still say to this day, I think Kentucky high school basketball tournament is the best in the country. And everybody argues with this, you know, like, Kentucky how, how, one, not taken away from the hoop hot beds, but it, it in Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, North Carolina, it's a religion, right? It, it means so much to those people. But it's it, there's just one state champion. Yeah. That's it. Right. I mean, you got, you know, Tennessee's got uh, five. Ohio's got, I, for, I quit counting. You know, I can't even imagine how many they got out in California and Texas. Right. There's just so many state champions. And I just love that format in Kentucky. There's one state champion. Right. Yeah. And so it, it was just learning the, the various levels, uh, the divisions and everything. And New York is tricky. Right. I mean, I literally printed out a pamphlet and I'm still reading it. 
learning the various levels and the private, the public, and how that breaks down, the city champions, and it's just very different. And so that was the big thing is just familiarizing myself with how New York high school basketball operates. And, uh, you know, also familiarizing myself with some <laughs> – <laughs> uh, Coach Marcus said at least they have a shot clock. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so just familiarizing myself with that and, and learning the various scholarships that are available in state only. Uh, you know, being a Tennessee guy, I, I take this opportunity to do this any chance I get. Tennessee was the first state they kind of led the way with the Tennessee Promise. Um, every graduating senior in the state of Tennessee is guaranteed two free years of community college. And so not just one year or the second year free, like those folks out in California try to confuse us, right? But they, um, it's, it's both, you know, you graduate, you get two free years of community college. And so I wanted to try to figure out what those scholarships were like, you know, what the options were. And, 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 and so that was the biggest challenge. It wasn't necessarily coming from Hamilton to Adirondack as much as it was coming from Ohio to New York. Yeah. So you had your, you know, I mean, New York in and of itself is almost two states between the city and then the rest right. of the states. Right. I've learned that. Right. <laughs> uh, but you had your to-do list. Did the school or, or the AD have anything specific that they wanted you to cover in those first 30 days? So he said he would have had I not presented my plan. Yeah. He said, you're so detailed in your plan that I'm going to put full trust and faith in you. So uh, he said, I had some things that I was looking for, some things that I wanted. He said, but I trust in you, your history and your brand, um, you know, be it at the NCCAA schools or Hamilton or the unaccredited institute. It doesn't matter where I go. I, I have a track record. Every school I've ever been, I have a winning record. I've increased the win total and I've increased the team GPA year one. And so he, he was able to verify some of these things and saw how detailed I was with my plan. And he said, look, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting your brand. I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you to do what you do. And so um, I'm turning it over to you. He said, I want you to recruit some young men that are going to be student athletes. And outside of that, I'm hands off. And so that's really all he said to me. He's given me almost full range to operate how I see fit. That's awesome. Well, man, um, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't get that many ADs, it's like full on. No, and he is. He's like, take, take it, run with it. Uh, and I'm really big on that. And, you know, um, we, we were, <laughs> we were all, we were right on the precipice of having the highest team GPA in the history of Miami Hamilton's program. It was the highest in 14 or 15 years, but we were right there on the precipice of having that. And um, we had a young man, it frustrates me so much. We had a young man who had the second highest team GPA the first semester, who doesn't even have to go to class. He's one of those guys, he doesn't have to open a book. Uh, he, he literally works a full-time job to pay for his tuition. Uh, he's in a work-study program. And he called me up. I got, the, I got the reports back. It was so odd. I couldn't get anything for the first three months of the semester and uh, because everything was online and everybody was struggling to get information in. And so normally I'd be able to throw a fit over nothing being put in, but this time I couldn't. And so right at the end of the semester, he messaged me, he says, I'm really sorry. I just decided not to do nothing this semester. He said, I'm going to go to summer school and make it all up and I'll get a 4.0. You have my word on it. And so he basically did nothing. And when I say he did nothing, he basically did nothing. And had he just been bad, we would have had the highest team GPA in, in program history. And so I was kind of frustrated. I'm like, oh, man. But at the same time, he's a young man. He almost can do what he wants in the classroom. He's that intelligent. So uh, I, I take pride in those things. And when I told him that that was the goal, um, you know, I told him I would, I would, I guaranteed him that we would double the win total. I would double the team GPA. He said that I need to hear nothing else. That's great. Well, I, I want to open this thing up to questions, but I got one more question kind of for you before we do, you know, it's really easy. I think when you take over a program to feel overwhelmed and just, uh, you know, cause you want to work, you want to work, 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 work. What are you doing to kind of, what's your vice? Take your mind off things. I know you, you can throw down in the kitchen a little bit, but what else are you doing <laughs> uh, to keep yourself busy and find your peace? Well, this is one area I haven't really struggled with much in my life. Being a therapist, I, I've always uh, realized the importance of self-care. And so there's two things that I do a lot of. Uh, one is reading. Um, and, and everybody, when I tell people that they want to, they want to just send me an influx of, you know, Alan Stein books and, th and that's great. Don't get me wrong. I read those too, but I don't do that kind of reading as a getaway. 
right? And so I like to read, you know, fiction and things like that. So I've been a big reader my entire life. Um, and so uh, I, I read it every opportunity. Um, I, I promise myself 30 minutes a night that I'll read before I go to bed. So that's every single night. Uh, I'm also a huge fisherman. So, I mean, I'm like, I got it bad. Like if I, like, seriously, I've got it bad. If if I can, <laughs> if I can sneak in five minutes at a pond in between doing something, I will literally run to the pond and sneak in five minutes of fishing before I have to do whatever it was I had planned. So those are two things I've been trying to do a lot of, uh, staying up on finding new books and, and things like that to read. Just, it, it's an escape for me. Yeah. And so those are two things that I've been doing a lot of, uh, and I've, I've kind of taken on a mission of one way that we've kind of expanded the college basketball press process uh, recently is trying to get new coaches opportunities, young coaches opportunities, or first time coaches opportunities, um, be it at the high school level, AAU, wherever we can, right? They just want to get their foot in the door in some kind of way. And so I've kind of taken that on as a side project and getting people their first coaching opportunities of some kind or making a connection or whatever that looks like. Uh, so believe it or not, that has also helped kind of put my mind at ease and take me away a little bit. Awesome. I love it. Well, guys, I, I want to open it up to questions. So if you got a question, feel free to just jump in, introduce yourself to Coach P and, and ask. Before we do that, can yeah. I, I want to take a moment uh, for those of you on the call uh, on the Zoom that, that don't know, probably most of you guys that, that have followed us any amount of time do know this. But I do want to take the time and give, you know, first, thank you. Thank you, Brant. But I want to really, really give a huge shout out to Coach Marga. He, a lot of you guys know that he's going to be my assistant. Uh, at SUNY and uh, he's just uh, bright bright so a couple of you guys were on the call earlier and I want to sing his praises really quick and um, uh, the reason why I hired him how he's just one of those thorough young men that just is hungry and wants to you know learn and absorb and, and soak it up so I'd actually been leaning one direction and he reached out to me one, one of the things I want to do in the first 30 days first seven days one of my goals were uh, one of the last goals I had was to identify three serious coaching potential coaching uh, candidates. And he was not one of those guys. I had never even spoken to him at that point. And um, through me just randomly putting out a Zoom call he wanted to get in on and whatnot, I, I made his acquaintance. And um, he was the only person that I interviewed that I did not do so via Zoom call. Um, I, I did some digging on him. And uh, I just, I really want to take this moment. I really try to empower uh, my assistant coaches. In fact, if, if there's just one assistant, I de facto make them the associate head coach. I don't care how much experience they have. I, I empower them probably to a fault. Um, my, my assistant coach at Hamilton last year, a great young man, DeMarco Kinnamore, did the same thing with him, uh, gave him a lot of input. And I just want to take a moment and, and sing Alan's praises. He, he did a full scout on our entire conference to, to woo me, and it worked. And and so I just want to, if you guys don't follow him or don't know him, please do so. He's a great, great young coach, and he's going to be an unbelievable asset to us this year. So I wanted to do that before uh, we took questions. So. I appreciate it, Coach. Thank you. That's, you know, not many guys scout an entire league in the interview process. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> being... I, I was curious on the league. I, I had not known the conference like – to be honest, even living in New York, SUNY Anironic is not on the map for, sure. for the state. It's, it's going to be. It, it's yes, it's going, <laughs> it's to, going be, to be. I can but promise it you. It definitely that. is not. It's right. it, it hasn't been. So I had to do a full like, all right, if I'm even interested in this job, let me see the landscape of New York State, how this how this fits in, and I sure. dug into the schools. So I appreciate Coach Payne uh, giving me the opportunity. I'm 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 really thankful. I, I cannot say that enough, man. I want to empower my guys to to do all they can do, and I'm very very thankful uh, that that you were interested because you're a perfect fit. All right, guys. If anyone else has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and, and hop in. It can be about anything, man. I'm I'm an open book, and I'm in no rush. So anything you guys want to ask or talk about, please do so. Coach, I have a quick question for you. How you doing, man? So how did you how do you feel about guaranteeing things that obviously you can't physically control? I mean, obviously you can do everything in your power to try and control doubling the win total and doubling the GPA, but do you think that the administration could use that against you if that's not something that you accomplish in the first year, second year, whatever uh, sure. the case may be? 
Oh, absolutely. It's going out on a limb. There's no question about it. Um, I feel like, um, I feel like it's, it's taking a risk. Um, I, I feel like I can do it. If, if I didn't feel like I could, you know, I think we also live in a, in a time where guarantees are, are not, um, they come a dime a dozen, right? <laughs> I mean, there's even a joke, if you're on social media at all, there's even jokes where people will send stuff out like, if this happens, I'm sending everybody who retweets this $100 tomorrow, right? So it's almost became a running joke with, with guarantees. Um, I just don't have any reason to feel like I can't. Um, and that's why I said that. I feel very confident that we can. But yeah, it absolutely could be used against me. Um, I don't think that it would be something that they would let me go over. Uh, but yeah, it, it definitely is a calculated risk. There's no question about that. And that's a great question. You're the first person that's asked that. Um, and it's something that I wouldn't recommend everybody do. Um, you know, it comes with a level of confidence based on, uh, you know, some of that came with knowing certain guys that would want to come play for me. Um, some recruits that I knew would follow me if I'd went to Hamilton or SUNY or if I'd went to Pork and Bean County State College. It wouldn't have really mattered, right? And so some of that comes with that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a calculated risk and one that I'll have to answer to if I don't succeed. It'll be on me. And I'm willing to, I'm willing to answer for that. So that's a great question, man. That was a great question. Calculated for sure. <laughs> it is risky. It is. It's, cal it's calculated risk for sure. Awesome. Anybody else have any questions? Want to hop in? Coach, how's it going? Uh, hey, how you doing, man? Good. So I just moved from Kansas to Arizona, and I'm uh, trying to pick your brain a bit on like networking through social media and like how sure. you know, all those high school coaches via social media. What's like some tips and some things that go into that? You know, I think this is with any walk of life, but number one is be persistent, right? Don't quit. It's, it's, you may reach out to 50 coaches and none of them even look, right? But you reach out for that one and it works, right? So be persistent. Present yourself in a manner that's going to make them want to take notice and just keep trying. I cannot stress that to you enough because you're going to hear no a thousand times. And, and that could be from no response at all. You may hear no. And I'll give you an example of something that is not necessarily the same, but I think it's a good analogy. Uh, for any of you guys that follow me on social media, you may see that I'll do these spotlights on our members, right? So I'll put this stuff out about guys or girls, young people that we have. And, and, um, I may float it out there once and I may do it again the next month and I may do it again the next month. And, and, and I'm not getting anything, right? I'm like, man, I know this kid can play and nobody's really responding and I'm putting it out and I know coaches are seeing it. I've got enough people following me. I know they're seeing it. And it, I even get disheartened sometimes. I'm like, man, why, why is this kid not getting the traction that I feel like they, you know, I take it really personal. When somebody comes on and asks for my help, I take it very serious. It's not something I take lightly. And so uh, I just keep trying because I know eventually something will break. I know it will. It may not come today. It may not come tomorrow. So what I would do is come up with a detailed plan. Okay. Am I married to this area? You mentioned that you just moved there, right? So it's likely that you're married to the area if you just moved there. So, right. Come up with a plan. I want to reach out to X, Y, and Z coaches this week and explain why I feel like, you know, this would be, a, I'd be a good fit or would like to learn from them or possibly get looked at. So sell yourself, man. You cannot oversell yourself. You just cannot do that. Like Coach Marga, I had no idea he'd even be interested in the job. And he reaches out to me one day. He's like, hey, I'd like to talk to you. I almost didn't message him back because I was like, eh, is he really interested? And so literally, even after he reached out and said he was, I almost didn't reach out to him. Right. And so it, it was just a persistence. And, and so don't stop. And I know that this is, you know, advice or information that you get in any walk of life, but it's serious. Uh, you got to keep going. You got to keep trying. You got to keep networking. You got to keep, you know, learning who the next coach is or getting to know the next person or getting to know the next assistant and just really soak up any connection that you can make because it's all about connections, man. And don't let anybody convince you otherwise. It's all about connections. Don't get frustrated though. I promise you, because I mean, there's, there's a, there's a gentleman that reached, just reached out to me. He's uh, he's in his fifties 
and he's he just retired from a state job and he he's re- he really knows the stuff he's really good and he said he'd been trying to get into the basketball world coaching now for about three years and uh he just reached out to me for some advice and he just kept going and he finally got a high school coaching gig as an assistant um and so you just got to keep trying if this is what you want you can't give up on it you got to keep trying it's not the same as a player we aren't limited with a four-year window <laughs> right you, so you look like a young guy, keep trying, man. Don't give up at any opportunity you get. And, and then, you know, uh, you may have reached out to me, may not. DM me on Twitter. I'll look for it. And then I can I can see what I can do to help pass, you know, your name on to people as well. On the flip side of what he just said, like he didn't, he didn't think to respond back to me because I wouldn't be really interested. It was because I was just at a D1 university. That's what I'm mm-hmm. guessing is why he thought that. So I'm just at a D1 university. Why would I want to go help him? And I know based on what I need as a coach to seek that out. And I have no recruiting background and he's got recruiting in his background. And that's something I needed. So I persist. I was very, I tried to be persistent with him. I got on a zoom call with him just because he mentioned wanting to connect with new people in New York. So I hopped into that. You just very persistent and seek out people that, you need to connect with. I know I need to work on my recruiting and knowing more people. So I'm willing to go seek that out. So that's why I was persistent with him. And that's why he didn't think to. Yeah. I mean, I figured he, I figured he already had experience, right? I'm like, okay, he's, he's probably got this now, you know, people ask me all the time, what are the, the things that you bring to the table as a coach that separates you from others? And I get asked this question all the time. And I think there's two things about me. And I, you got to be self-aware, right? You can't, you got to, you got to have answers when people ask you questions like that. And I think, I think I truly am a next level recruiter. Um, when we were at Hamilton, I, I landed, you know, the starting five at the number one ranked high school in the state of Ohio. And I think maybe only Brant can understand how huge that is. Um, I mean, it was unbelievable the, the the kid that I got to commit for me coming from the school that he came from to commit to one of the branch campuses in Ohio was unheard of. And um, so I think that is the number one thing that I bring to the table. And then my approach to the overall culture is a little bit different. Um, I, I'll say this forever. I don't have a playbook as thick as a phone book. I don't do that. Um, I don't, for me, and I think this is actually kind of relevant at all levels. And I shared this with you, Alan, is I think buy-in is more important than philosophy. And I really do believe that. Um, I think it, I think it is more true at the smaller colleges, but at the same time, I think it rings true everywhere because at any level you are, you're, you're with comparable competition. So I think buy-in is far more important than system. Uh, and so I'm huge on those two things, recruiting people that are truly going to buy in. And so, um, and I mentioned that to him, uh, but it, the same goes with you when you're selling yourself, Jackson, you gotta, you know, sell yourself on what you bring to the table, what you can do to, to generate, you know, interest in you and just don't give up with it, man. Keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. Coach Payne, uh, Coach Kareem, Brown, here from Niagara County Community College. How you doing, Coach? I am very good. Uh, two things. Um, w- what made uh, SUNY uh, enter the, the, the right fit for you coming from Ohio? And then right. two, have you thought about, uh, I guess, how you want to play based off of what your, what your, yeah, your player's good. strengths are or what you are strong enough coaching? Yeah, so the, the uh, you know, I mentioned that I had another opportunity. I won't, I won't mention the school. I'll just say that it was a Midwest NAI school uh, that had offered me the head coaching job. And at the time, I wasn't even interested in looking for another job. So I turned that job down. Um, but um, there, there was a myriad of things that kind of happened. One is it, it is kind of personal, so I won't share that. But I'll say that it was in my personal life that made that position appealable to me. I, I really wanted to pursue that because of a personal situation in my life. Uh, secondly, there was such a connection with their athletic director. I don't think I've ever had one like it before. Um, the interview process with that group of people was unlike any interview um, 
I, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, it, that that um that AD man, he's special. He, he's got this kind of um, he's very much similar to me in that he's much more of a a buy-in person as he is a system person. And and when when it was it was just a really good first interview. It was one of those things that clicked. And and I won't use the word serendipitous because I think that that downplays. I am kind of a man of faith, so I don't want to I don't want to say that because I do I do believe in certain things, and I think it was one of those meant to be kind of things. And so uh, that that's the that that's what pushed it over the top for me in choosing Adirondack uh, because look, you know, one of the things he asked me in the interview, he said, "Look, man, you're coming to upstate New York, and you don't sound like us." Right. <laughs> he said, you know, that's something that that will stand out here. He said, how you know, what's that going to be like for you? I said, I'm going I'm to play that to my advantage. I said, because I'll be the one coach nobody ever forgets when I come to talk to you. Right. And so uh, I'll be the, 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 the tall, bald guy that sounds like he's from Memphis coming to talk. And so I'm going to use that to my advantage. But, um, yeah, that that was something that. Um, that um, it was just that connection, man. It was something a little different with that athletic director than I'd ever experienced with anyone else in the basketball world before. And in terms of playing, um, I'm just, like I said, I'm going to get guys that want to buy in. So as long as they want to buy in, they can do what we do. And I, that's not a short answer. I don't want to downplay your question, but that's a real honest answer. They're going to buy into what we do. And if they buy into what we do, then we'll be fine. Appreciate it. Thank you. Kareem, I think we've worked the Damon camp together. Did you work the Damon camp? Yes, like last year? Yeah, I worked last year. Yes. Okay. Okay. I thought you looked familiar. Um, you're working at next month too? No, I'm not. I'm, oh, you're not going to? No, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pass on this summer. I, I'm, I'm not, uh, not, com <laughs> not comfortable yet. Yeah. Okay. I just figured I, I was like I put it in I figured I'd just say it out loud in person but like I was gonna say I think we've worked the Damon camp so that should be fun as long as we stay safe coach Payton I got another one for you kind of uh, sure. how do you balance um, running a really successful recruiting server uh, and also <laughs> running a basketball program and keeping that line between the two well, first, I got to smack your hand. College basketball process is not a recruiting service. And I'm glad you said that because most people think that's what it is. Yeah. It's not. That's not what it is. Um, in fact, when I started it, it was not even geared towards recruiting, right? Inevitably, that's one thing that kind of came to the top. But that's not what we are by any stretch. I mean, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we travel and we do speaking engagements at different uh, – we've done – some of the largest AAU tournaments in the nation. We've done school districts, just to teaching kids how to manufacture opportunities and, and what all is out there beyond, uh, you know, the, the flashing lights. Um, we had a contract with the entire school system here in Cincinnati. And it's, it's so fascinating to me that, uh, you know, we'd go in and ask these young people, hey, what school, you know, what schools are you interested in playing for? And obviously, being in this area, the first two schools that came up is University of Cincinnati and Xavier, right? I was like, okay, but what other schools are within a 15 minute radius and no one could say no one could tell me you know and, and there's a lot of schools within an hour radius of Cincinnati I mean I, I don't think people realize if you go 80 miles from Cincinnati you got like I forgot how many D1 schools there's over 80 colleges in a in an 80 mile radius of Cincinnati and so I, I've actually sat down and counted that before and so people just don't understand so when we first started it was all about the teaching and the education and so that's what it was geared to be was more so that when people started asking us for assistance with gaining exposure i was like okay the reason i decided to start doing that was because i felt I, well i still feel very adamant that people live off of young people's dreams in the basketball world and and they're charging some of these young people these recruiting services that that's all they do is, is, is expose them and, and they don't do that well, but they, they're charging some of these young people and their families $1,500, $2,000 a year to do this. And I'm like, look, that's not what we are. I've got a good following. I've got a base. You, now we limit how many people we bring on 
just because if you want to technically be a member, I just can't, I don't have enough time in the day to do everything. And so, um, but we'll, we'll help people and, and help get their name out there. But what we really strive to be at the college basketball process is this all encompassing college basketball resource, because we we've helped coaches get jobs and we've even helped uh, certain institutions with uh, admissions and tour days and things like that. Well, we're, we're helping just colleges in general and athletic departments in general. So we're definitely not a recruiting service. And, and I have made a commitment to never recruit my members because I do think that that would be a little unethical. Now I'll recruit from our threads and things that we'll put out there, but I don't ever recruit our members. So, um, but how I do it for a while, it was getting overwhelmed. Uh, I'll, I'll be very honest with you. I started to start to get to a point, which is why I was in the position I was not having my hours with my therapy work. Uh, I started to drown for a little bit. I'll be honest. I was barely, barely spreading water. And I was very fortunate to, um, to land some interns. I have two that have been with me for a long time, but they do very specific work. Uh, and so I was very fortunate to land some interns and, and get kind of turned on to that, that, um, that world. And so now I'm, I'm actually pretty hands off lately, um, not having to do a lot. Uh, it's even sometimes just blows some people's minds. Sometimes the stuff that you see on Twitter, it is my words, but it's not even me tweeting it. So one, I have one intern in particular who's been with me for a long time. I'll put a bunch of tweets and stuff in the queue and I'm like, Hey, have at it, tweet whatever you want today. And so it's actually my words, but it's him doing it. And so there's been, there's been even a couple of times where I went stretch of two or three weeks and didn't even get on Twitter. And it was all my intern, Tony, that was doing it. Um, and people didn't even know that. So I say that to say this, I've had a lot of help. Uh, people who buy into the, to what we're doing because they know that I'm not taking advantage of these young people. They know I'm not trying to price gouge them and, and, and whatnot. I'm just, you know, we, we, we're really fortunate. We actually offer uh, an evaluation to every person that reaches out to become a member with us from a college panel. I've got over 80 current college coaches that do this for me uh, just because they believe in what we're doing. And so I'll send their highlight films out or whatever. And, and so they'll, they'll get evaluated and I'll send back a, a very unbiased, thorough evaluation for these young people that may have been told that they're D1 or whatever. And then these college coaches are giving them a real honest evaluation. So I only, the only catch is I, I don't tell them who the coaches are because the coaches don't really, you know, bothered and blown up with it. But uh, so, no, we're just kind of an all encompassing resource, but um, honestly, some days it gets overwhelming. Um, and some days my wife is very unhappy. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. She's like, you got to put the phone down, man. You've been on it too much today. Um, and it's, it's tough to balance. I never, I never in a million years dreamed that um, it would turn out, what it has become. And I say this exact thing several times and I don't want to sound like I'm famous because that for God knows that's not the case, but I guess in this little bitty pin drop of the world, I'm well known. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was a college coach for over a decade and I could walk into a gym and unless I had a shirt on, nobody even looked at me. Right. I can't go to a basketball event anymore without people talking to me, which is kind of weird. Uh, I like it, but it's kind of weird because that's not ever really what I, you know, foreseen happen. So it was just interesting how it's kind of taken off. And, but, but I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm blessed. Uh, you know, and people ask me this question often, if you had to choose, which one would you choose? And in the beginning, I absolutely would say coaching. Now that's not the answer anymore. If I was ever put in a position to choose, I would choose the college basketball process because I feel like I have a farther reach. I feel like I help more people. Uh, I feel like I'm able to do a lot more with that to the point that I actually turned down a D1 women's assistant job this summer. Uh, I would have turned it down anyway, but that was the reason I gave. I was like, there's just no way I could ever consider that because the NCAA doesn't allow you to to do the two. Um, so, yeah, it was a great question, man. Um, but we're not a recruiting service, so remember that. Not a recruiting service. <laughs> well, but I, I – I think from the external view, sometimes it's perceived as that. So I, I think so. I think it is. And that's one of the reasons why we continue with the education and things. And, um, you know, I, I had some lofty goals that I had to put on the back burner that I'm now going to readdress with the college basketball process, just because the Hamilton job fell in my lap and, and I wasn't expecting that. And, um, so I'm hoping here in the next couple of months to get some of those things off the ground. A lot of the information and the videos we share is going to go exclusively on the website. 
Uh, that way people have access to any topic. So we'll have different topics with recruiting videos and, you know, my, my uh, Periscope videos that I do with information and whatnot. We're just going to do a little more professional with a backdrop and whatnot. But, um, and then, and then putting those on there will also free me up because uh, I'll take DMs and, and requests for certain topics to cover and whatnot. So hopefully every time I get one, I can just add that to the website. And that's one less thing that I have to do to get that. And it kind of becomes its own operating entity, so to speak. Awesome. Well, we're, we're kind of rolling up on 730 here. I want to be really respectful of everybody's time. So one last question for you. You roll sure. in those first 30 days as a head coach. What What's next? You know, what are your goals for year one? I know you touched on them a little bit, but. Uh, really, it's really simple. Um, to, to really secure commitments from young people who want to get an education. People say it. I mean it. You know, if you don't go to class, if you don't do those things, you're not going to play for me. Um, I, I won't put the team GPA out there as a whole, but I'll say this. It was under a 1.0 last year. And that ain't going to happen with me. You know, you know, he asked, uh, how can I guarantee that that's not going to happen with me? I'll, I'll sacrifice the win total before I sacrifice that part. Um, and so the goals are simple. We're going to recruit these young people. Uh, it's kind of on a hold until August, but we're going to recruit these young people and we're going to double our win total. We're going to double our team GPA and we're going to build a culture of buy-in, period. It's that simple. And those are the three things that I'm going to do this season. Uh, we still want to bring on a student assistant or a volunteer assistant, uh, hoping to do that next month. And uh, hopefully that takes off. So have a, have a three-man staff and uh, – and that's it, man. We're going to do those three things this year. You can take it to the bank. That's going to happen. Those are our goals for this year. Awesome, Coach. Well, I really appreciate you for jumping on. I want to send a huge thank you to you. I know um, time is precious right now for everybody. So, big thank you for you jumping on. I know you guys are going to be Happy to. crazy successful this year. So, I'm looking forward to following you. I, and I want to thank everybody else for hopping on. I'm really looking forward to this series. Next week, I got – Markel Cox coming on. He's the head women's basketball cool. coach at Arkansas Monticello. Markel has cool. a crazy story that he's going to share with everybody. Um, and I think it's going to be a really cool show. Another thank you to Rising Coaches for the opportunity. Um, make sure you check out their website, risingcoaches.com. They've got women in sports going on right now. If you hop off here and want to hop over, um, Ashton and that's a great job with women in sports. So thanks again, guys, and we'll see you next week. Hit me up if you need anything on Twitter, guys.